Greetings, and this presentation is called What is Reciprocal Altruism? And in this short presentation, we're going to try to answer three questions. First, we're going to review the puzzle of altruism and why altruism is puzzling from an evolutionary perspective. Secondly, we're going to answer the question, what is reciprocal altruism and how does it solve the altruism puzzle? And third, we're going to look at some evolved psychological features that might reflect reciprocal altruism. And we're going to look at four of these. So the key contributor uh, to the theory of reciprocal altruism is Robert Tribbers, who published a paper by this title in 1971. So the puzzle of altruism, again, is that if you are an altruist from a Darwinian perspective, you harm your own reproductive success to increase the reproductive success of other individuals. And the question is how that could possibly evolve or be sustained by natural selection. It would appear that selection would continually act against the altruist and slowly eliminate altruists from populations. And we posed this earlier as how can we possibly win by losing? How can we get ahead uh, when we're constantly giving up reproductive benefits to others? So reciprocal altruism is a second solution to this. Earlier we looked at Hamilton's rule and here's the way reciprocal altruism works. We're going to start again with two agents, blue and orange, that we're going to also call A and B. And in an altruistic act, a blue benefits orange. So we turn orange green to show the benefit has been received. And as a result of that, blue is harmed. And we have turned blue red to show the harm. So A has benefited B, and as a result, A has been harmed. And the key thing here that Tribbers hit on is that the harm needs to be much less than the benefit. And if this is the case, by trading altruistic acts, two individuals can come out ahead. So in the next uh, encounter, altruism is reciprocated. Now orange benefits blue, B benefits A, and as a result, B is harmed. So we run the green arrow in the other direction, and blue is now benefited, and as a result, orange is harmed. And again, the key here is that the benefit is much greater than the harm. And so if we sum this together, the final outcome will be that A and B both benefit more than they're harmed. So they both come out winners. In each direction, the altruistic act, the benefit, is greater than the reproductive harm of engaging in that act. Now there's three critical points to the argument of reciprocal altruism. Again, the first is that the benefit to the recipient must outweigh the harm to the altruistic donor. The second is that the donor's altruism has to be reciprocated. So if you make a donation, an altruistic act, and there's no reciprocity, uh, you simply lose. The third is that two individuals can engage in this, and they need not be close genetic relatives. And indeed, uh, Trivers stressed what's called symbiosis between different species. So reciprocal altruism gives us a way for altruism to evolve without Hamilton's requirement for close genetic relatedness. The puzzle is how can such reciprocity ever get started, and once it gets started, how can it persist? Several solutions have been offered, and what they share is the need for repeated interactions. Now we're going to look at that more later in terms of a mathematical model that's called the prisoner's dilemma. 
But for right now, we're going to look at the characteristics of small-scale human societies and some psychological features that appear to accompany uh, our altruistic tendencies. So here's a Shu'ar house. Uh, the Shu'ar live in Ecuador, and they practice hunting and gathering and some horticulture. They're a small-scale society, which means they're a face-to-face -face society, and it's quite likely that two band members will see each other more than once. And this is terribly important for reciprocal altruism. You have to bump into each other more than one time. You need to interact repeatedly. And this is certainly a condition that was present over the long run of the Pleistocene in small-scale human societies. Now, Trivers stressed that there was an evolved psychology that would be associated with reciprocity. And one thing that he stressed was that we needed to have species that had long-term relationships, and it would be very useful to have a long memory for past interactions. In particular, we should remember when people have harmed us, when they've taken advantage of us and not returned our generosity, and this is a photo, of course, of Pearl Harbor, uh, which uh, stays very powerful in American memory. Um, so it wasn't the occasion of greatest death during World War II. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Americans were to die in the war. But we remember Pearl Harbor because of the act of deception that we associate with it. And Trevor suggested that our minds, our brains, should have a particular interest in being deceived or taken advantage of, uh, that should stick with us for a very long time, and we should remember that. A second thing uh, that we can point to is emotions that we associate with friendship. So one thing is a capacity for empathy, and humans seem to have a developed capacity for empathy. We associate friendship often with high levels of trust. We expect friends to be loyal and not to betray our trust. Uh, we have senses of mutual debt and obligation to one another. Even if we say uh, we'll do anything for a friend without return, in fact, we generally expect our friends to reciprocate uh, uh, selflessly in their relations with us. And we similarly have very pronounced feelings of betrayal and guilt if we have this close relation and our trust and loyalty isn't repaid. So friendship is something recognized among in all human societies, in human relations. Um, it's an idea that travels very well. It varies culturally somewhat in how it's defined, but it's quite easily for people around the world to recognize. If you're interested, there's a recent study on friendship from an evolutionary perspective by Daniel Rushika of uh, the University of Arizona. A third thing that Trivers pointed to is that we should have mental modules or cognitive abilities to catch a cheat. Uh, we should be constantly scanning the horizon for people who are deceiving us. And that's, of course, because there's an even greater payoff if somebody doesn't reciprocate. And he suggested that this would produce an arms race in terms of selection between our talents for deceiving one another and our talents for detecting cheating. And this does indeed seem to be a big part of human life. Uh, we're constantly evaluating relationships uh, that we have with other people, especially close ones, uh, for signs of deception. Trevor's most original argument, I think in some ways, and one that he's pursued at great length least recently, he has a book out called The Folly of Fools, uh, The Logic of Deceit and Self-Deception in Human Life. And he argued that the best cheaters would be those who are able to deceive themselves. So if we can deceive ourselves, uh, we can deceive other people because we'll put on such a good front of being honest and reliable, and we ourselves won't be aware that we're doing that. So he suggested that uh, our brains might have evolved uh, this capacity for self-deception because that would be selected for 
in the ability to take advantage of close relationships and gain benefits without cost. So thank you for listening. Uh, we'll be back with more.